the birth of the flour milling industry in minneapolis minnesota occurred in the mid 19th century following the height of the saw milling industry in minneapolis with access to abundant water power provided by st anthony falls wheat from the northern great plains and railroad tracks connecting it to the east minneapolis was a logical place for a flour milling industry to emerge as a result of the revolution in the flour milling industry the washburn amyl exploded on may second 1878. The reaction to the explosion sparked many factory reforms. These reforms led to a boom in flour mill industries, better safety laws, and the growth and development of Minneapolis, Minnesota, and the northern Midwest as a whole. Eugene Smalley of the Northwest Illustrated is quoted saying, For favorable conditions for grinding wheat, no place in the world can compare with Minneapolis. It is on the highways of rail transportation which lead from the grain fields of the northwest to the great cities and seaports of the east. Nature turns its hundreds of wheels with an unfailing water power, and the climate is healthful and invigorating. The only setback was the missing link between the wheat grown in the region and the existing, centuries-old, flour-producing methods' ability to process the wheat. In response to the tremendous opportunity, in the 1870s, Minneapolis changed its process to more technologically advanced process, the gradual reduction method. This process better accommodated the northern Great Plains' wheat. First, iron or porcelain rollers replaced the millstones. The wheat was ground several times to produce superior flour. The next step in the process was the middlings purifier. The device purified the flour, but also produced a lot of dust. Soon mills in Minneapolis began producing flour at an unprecedented scale. The flour produced by the new process held twice the value of the low-grade flour produced by the previous process. The quality was such that the flour from Minneapolis was considered the best in the West. The process that began being used in the 1870s has changed little to this day. In 1874, history was made again. Cadwaller C. Washburn built the Washburn A Mill. The mill stood six and one-half stories high, making it the largest in the nation. The mill was equipped with the Midlings Purifier, but not a dust collector, so every piece of machinery was coated with dust. This dust was the only major setback in the Minneapolis flour milling revolution. Few realized the lethal power of the dust until May 2nd, 1878. At around 7 o'clock p.m., the dust inside the washburn ignited and the washburn A-mill exploded, starting a fire that leveled the A-mill and five other neighboring mills. It also destroyed property throughout the city, in some cases 10 miles away. The fire killed 18 workers in all. Edward E. Ritchie recalled the explosion as follows. A black and terrible cloud shot up into the sky. 300 feet it rose, loaded with huge rock, timbers, and debris. 300 feet the lurid and awful flames followed it. The sheet of flames seemed to cover the entire milling district. One third of Minneapolis's flour milling power was instantly destroyed, making it the worst dust explosion in Minneapolis history. Some regard it as the greatest catastrophe in the history of milling. The explosion of the A-mill appalled those native to Minneapolis, but it attracted the nation's attention and in turn the world's. Newspapers from cities around the country, such as St. Louis and New York, dedicated articles to it the following day. Even a month after the explosion, the ruins still smoldered and crowds flocked to the site. Salesmen sold copies of the book, History of the Mill Explosion at County Fairs. M. L. Renfro even wrote a song about the explosion. Many reforms followed the disaster. The millers took the opportunity, as they rebuilt the level district, to equip it with the newest technology. Soon after the explosion, C. C. Washburn addressed the city. He said, The money loss is not to be considered. I think only of the poor victims and of their families. The mills shall be rebuilt at once. And rebuilt they were better than before. Cadwaller C. Washburn then hired William Day Labar to install the Barron's Millstone Exhaust. This device was designed to collect dust to prevent another dust explosion. The exhaust gained industry-wide use after the explosion. The new Washburn A-Mill was, for a short time, the largest flour mill in the world. Although the Washburn A-Mill explosion was by far the most famous, it was just one of the many mills that exploded during the late 1800s. Science soon explained the volatility of dust, and the United States Department of Agriculture advised millers to keep their floors dust-free. So to prevent more explosions, cleanliness was insisted upon. 
The mills hired sweepers to keep their floors free from dust. The mills were also equipped with better quality monitor nozzles, fire doors, wire glass windows, fire alarms, and dust collectors. These reforms, along with the rebuilding of the airmill, propelled Minneapolis into a nationwide dominance of the flour milling industry. The Washburn Airmill explosion gave the Minneapolis millers the perfect opportunity to institute these new technologies. This helped Minneapolis be the leader they became, and, in William Day Labar's words, The mill explosion of May 2, 1878, first brought Minneapolis into general public notice as a milling center. Once the new Washburn A mill was completed in 1880, the height of the milling industry in Minneapolis began. Minneapolis would be leading as the main producer of flour for 50 years to come. From 1880 to 1930, Minneapolis was the leader in flour production, causing a boom in the city. In these years, the mill district shipped out an average of 16 million barrels of flour annually. That is enough flour to make 4 trillion 480 million pounds of bread. In 1884, Minneapolis surpassed Budapest, Hungary as the world's leading flour producer. During this period, Minneapolis was known as the flour milling capital of the world, or more informally, Mill City. Minneapolis experienced a population boom during the height of the milling industry. Its population grew from 13,000 to 165,000. This was due to the new immigrants coming to Minneapolis to keep the farms, mills, and railroads running to support the industry. The new citizens were also employed by businesses supporting the flour milling, like the ironworks, barrel, and sack industries. During the industry's heyday, names that are still widely recognized today, Pillsbury and General Mills, were becoming prominent. Because of the need to sell the enormous output of flour, these companies creatively approached marketing and advertising to create a greater demand for their product. After 1930, the flour milling industry in Minneapolis began to decline. There were many factors for this decline, including decreasing quality and quantity in the northern Great Plains' wheat, changes in distribution patterns, and a new tariff that gave Buffalo, New York an advantage over Minneapolis. In 1930, Buffalo, New York became the nation's leading flour producer, forcing Minneapolis out of its cherished spot it had held for 50 years. By 1960, most of Minneapolis's major mills had shut down. The flour milling revolution in Minneapolis not only impacted the flour milling industry, but also had lasting effects on other spheres. After milling in Minneapolis faded into the background, it left an imprint on Minneapolis, Minnesota, and the region as a whole. Milling helped create a base for future economic strength and kept it even when milling began to decline. For example, the railroads created to transport raw wheat from the northern Great Plains and move processed flour to the east helped support future industries even as the mills fell silent. Also, the mills spread on a growth in banking. Huge amounts of money were needed to build the big mills and stock them with machinery. Most of this money was provided by the local bankers. This is one of the reasons why Minneapolis was the financial center of the Northwest by the beginning of the 20th century. Flour milling also developed many other industries to serve them, including the barrel industry and later the sack industry. Since the explosion, the United States Occupational Safety and Health Administration has made reforms in the area of explosion safety. They have made regulations limiting the amount of dust allowed in the air at mills, requiring the mills to use dust collectors. Flour milling in Minneapolis has also had an effect on the culture of Minneapolis. The first Minneapolis baseball team was named the Millers, and a radio station made to advertise the Washburn Crosby Company Flower, WCCO, is now a major radio and television station of the area. The flour milling industry was an important predecessor to the packaged food industry in the northern Midwest. As the flour milling industry grew, the leaders began to create brand identities leading to the birth of the packaged food industry. Pillsbury and General Mills, the two leading flour companies, became highly successful and sophisticated consumer products marketing companies. Also, to support the milling industry, millions of acres of the northern Great Plains were brought under cultivation, making the area what was, and is, one of the most productive agricultural areas on earth. Milling also attracted the population that made Minneapolis a major city and provided the money that fueled its growth. Without the Washburn A mill explosion and the flour milling industry as a whole in Minneapolis history, Minneapolis, Minnesota, and the northern Midwest would not be the same.